everybody, we're going to um, go ahead and get started with our next speaker. Uh, my name is Irving Berkner. I'm the Associate Director of the Committee on Southern Asian Studies and the South Asia Language and Area Center. Uh, and it's a great pleasure for me this afternoon to introduce Kathy Morrison, who's the Newcomb Family Professor of Anthropology, and as of last week, the Director of the South Asia Language and Area Center, which means she's my boss, and uh, I'm going to try not to screw up what she works on. Um, she got her PhD from Berkeley in uh, 1992, and she's been here at Chicago since uh, 1996. And uh, Kathy works on the um, archaeology and historical anthropology of southern India in, um, well, basically all the time, as I looked through her work, uh, the pre-colonial, early, early colonial, and also uh, fairly recent history of India, um, and specifically at the causes and consequences of agrarian transformation, um, where you see the uh, connections between power relations and environmental change, and, and really how um, the, the power and, and these things affect um, a, a process that began centuries ago right up to the present um, with things like dam construction and then a, a rash of farmer suicides. Um, I would direct you to her website, uh, Kathleen, Morrison, Kathleen Morrison Lab com or the Anthropology uh, Department website uh, for more on her publications. So with that, here's Kathy Morrison. Thank you, Irving, and uh, thank you all for sitting. Boy, it seems really loud, doesn't it? Uh, thank you all for sitting uh, so patiently in such hot and kind of a loud room. So I'm going to try and cover a lot of ground today, um, so hopefully you'll have a lot of questions at the end. And what I want to do today is to talk about, um, oh, it's funny it's not on the screen too, talk about three kinds of uh, what we can think of really, I think, as unnatural disasters in South Asia. Um, South Asia being um, primarily uh, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh today. Um, little numbers here to show you where we're going. And so we're talking about different environments and different times, um, but in, in all three of the case studies that I'm going to talk about, we'll see conjunctions of structural conditions of power that led to high levels of vulnerability. And these are combined with what we can think of as sort of beliefs and desires uh, on the part of those who were in power that were quite disastrous for the vulnerable, for the poor and the powerless. Um, so that these kinds of disasters always take place within specific environmental contexts and environmental parameters. And here we'll be talking today mostly about water and to a certain uh, extent energy. Um, and these can be extreme conditions as we'll talk about today, about drought and about flood. But they don't even have to be. So we'll see, we'll close at the very end of this talk with a brief consideration of um, debates over dam construction in western India today where we have people who are literally being flooded out of their homes in the absence of what you might think of as real or natural floods um, as the waters of newly constructed reservoirs uh, inundate their houses. So today uh, we have three topics as I said and I just want to um, reassure you in a decreasing length so we'll talk about each one more and more briefly as we go. Um, so to reiterate probably what you've heard from uh, at least every other speaker, I'm going to guess, uh, when we look at the history of South Asia, we can see that so-called natural disasters are never entirely natural, that nature alone cannot make a disaster. Disaster is a cultural concept. And so many of the examples we'll look at today um, have been at least, as I would put it, partially engineered, that is either wittingly and or unwittingly created by the operation of political and economic power in particular contexts. So what I'm not, I'm not trying to make to say that South Asia prior to colonization, prior to the British colonization in particular, was some kind of disaster-free paradise, quite, quite the opposite. But there's very little doubt that the most serious, as measured in terms of the number of deaths, um, disasters in South Asian history took place during the 300 years of British colonial occupation. And we'll have a look at some of these crises today and then close with a little bit more contemporary debate uh, in India. And so that we can see, for example, that engineering disaster can be done by uh, independent as well as by uh, colonial governments. So it's not a kind of special ability of colonized, uh, colonizing powers. So we're going to start with the Bengal Delta, 
Um, or you can think of this question, this section as being something like this. Why is the country of Bangladesh just such a basket case, right? As growing up, uh, for me, Bangladesh was always kind of iconic, really, of both disaster and of poverty. But of course, there's a history here. I want to think a little bit about how it came to be that way. So every year in Bangladesh, uh, about 26,000 square kilometers, or about 18% of the country is flooded in an ordinary year. Um, it typically kills around 5,000 people and destroys around 7 million homes. That's a normal year. But during severe floods, um, the affected areas may exceed 75% of the country. As in 1998, 75% of the entire country of Bangladesh was underwater. 75% um, of Bangladesh is actually less than 10 meters above sea level, and about 80% of the country is floodplains, one of the great floodplains of the world, where the, the Ganges and the um, Brahmaputra rivers come together to form an active floodplain. And we tend to think of this in a way as bad, the kind of volatility and liveliness of the landscape. But of course people live there for a reason, and that's that this area is an incredibly fertile and productive agricultural environment. Um, scholars who have been working on the environmental history of this region have characterized the transition from the pre-colonial regimes of um, agriculture to post-colonial strategies as a transition from flood adapted to flood prone. And we'll talk a little bit about how this came to be. So um, the, from the 19th century onward we have a situation in which floods, which were once seen as beneficial, really the lifeblood of the country, now constitute serious problems. Okay, so the, the environment of a significant amount of Bangladesh and of course also a part of West Bengal on the Indian side um, is, as I said, uh, an active floodplain formed by the confluence of several major rivers. It's in a grading landscape, that is there's more and more land being formed if each year. Um, and the current level of coastline is significantly further out to sea than it was 100 or 200 years ago. These rivers, these great North Indian rivers, which includes the Indus to System 2, receive inputs not only from the annual monsoon rains, but also from snowmelt from the Himalayas. So every seasonal snowmelt um, in the spring, as well as the summer monsoon rains in particular, feed these great rivers. So there are quite significant seasonal pulses of water in these North Indian river systems. Um, and they carry a lot of silt, very rich, fertile, productive silt, so there's an annual renewal of soil fertility. This kind of water and silt tends to flush out any salts that have accumulated in the soil from previous seasons of irrigation, prevents salinization, and makes, in general, a very, very highly favorable um, situation for agriculture. If we think about the Bengal Delta, um, in a way we have to think about what constitutes land and what constitutes water a little bit differently. There's really a kind of ambiguous demarcation between land and water in this place because it's an actively constructed landscape. It's not old and stable, it's constantly being reworked and remade, right? So land disappears one year and appears in a new place uh, the next year. And so villagers or agriculturalists have historically always had to be very flexible. They have to be able to move their houses, they have to move their fields, sometimes their entire villages. And we see the development of um, chars or these kind of island villages, you can see one in the upper left, um, that are t artificially raised up, you can see it during a period of flood here. And these villages don't not always last that long. They be moved from place to place, uh, and that's simply a normal sort of fact of life. People move around by boat quite a bit, um, do a lot of fishing, and it's also the case historically that very extensive mangrove swamps along the coast have been very important in providing a kind of um, uh, mitigating impact for the hurricanes which also sweep up and, and hit the country periodically. So we have uh, in, in, at the beginning of our story, you might say, a kind of flexible, mobile, flood adapted kind of sets of agricultural strategies and residential strategies. Um, but what that also means is things like claims to land are also fairly flexible. If you have to move your village, if you have to move your field, then there have to be ways in which you can claim access to other kinds of locations. So there was very little attempt 
attempt prior to the 18th or 19th century to try and control the flood regimes. These are very, very strong and vast rivers. It wasn't seen as really possible um, or really any point to it. Okay. Um, the center of British colonial experience in South Asia, the, the earliest British colonial outpost was near a little village, Kolkata, um, and it formed the basis of the um, East India Company's uh, fort, uh, Fort William, which later grew up to be the city of Calcutta, now renamed Kolkata after the original village. So Kolkata was the seat of British colonial power in South Asia, and it was the capital until 1911 when it was shifted to Delhi. So the East India Company um, was the became the, the de facto ruler of that area and then after um, the great uh, revolt of 1857 the British Crown uh, took up direct administrative control over the Indian territories which had grown to be quite uh, much more extensive by then. So what we have with the British colonial experience in South Asia is really an empire that was founded on principles of trade and profit. So money making as we'll see and turning a profit and being thrifty are very much parts of the sort of mindset of British colonial rule. But as important as trade was, the real money in running South Asia is in land revenue. Because even today, um, primarily ag agrarian country, even modern, modern India has the highest percentage of rural residents of any, an, any major um, Asian country. Um, and so the, the most significant uh, revenue source was always collecting taxes on agriculturalists and farmers. Okay. So one of the, I can, I'm not going to give you the whole history of British colonialism today, but in thinking about the environmental history of the Bengal Delta, a very important factor in the, in the physical transformation of the Delta was really a kind of inadvertent transformation of the physical environment. And that was caused in part by things like the construction of railroads. The first railroads were built in, um, in India in 1853. There was a very rapid expansion of the rail system so that by the 1870s there were links between Calcutta in the northeast, Bombay in the west, and Madras down in the southeast. That's quite an impressive accomplishment in a relatively short amount of time. Railroads, and I gave you a bad photo because this cool old train is actually running on a bridge instead of on a high embankment, but railroads require, particularly in a wet, squishy riverine environment like the Bengal Delta, a raised embankment to run on. Right? You a, you, we all know about railroad embankments. They're high above the regular ground surface. They've got the rails on them and so on. So all those railroad embankments and all the new roads that were put in by the British as well became kind of flood levees. So the flood waters, which normally in the past had sort of roamed around freely were now constrained by all of these kinds of walls and levees. At the same time there was a deliberate effort to construct flood embankments. Here's a, a contemporary one uh, on the lower left. So there was some attempt to control and sort of tame the rivers at this time, some on purpose and some somewhat accidentally by the extension of canals and uh, railroads. So there's a lot of good work now in the literature showing that this kind of haphazard network of embankments, of roads and flood control walls really changed a hydrological regime in which there were lots of smaller floods to now more occasional but much much larger and more destructive kinds of floods. So there was on the one hand a, a physical transformation of the environment. But under the British too there were other kinds of changes besides physical changes. Um, as I said, there was a colonial emphasis on revenue extraction. Um, the um, government in London was always interested in making sure that the colonies were profitable. And the focus on shifting land revenue, that is taxes on farmers, shifted throughout the colonial period, relatively rapid, from taxes collected in kind, that is to say if somebody grows rice, you know, you give me 35% of your rice crop, to taxes collected in cash. So what that means then is that agriculturalists have to participate in a market economy, at least to some extent, in order to get cash to pay their taxes. They can no longer be entirely subsistence um, farmers. 
Cash taxes are not a unique invention of the British. They did exist pre-colonially. But there was a much more widespread um, expansion of cash economies um, under co co colonialism. And especially in the Bengal Delta, a lot of expansion of um, commercial cash crops, including some crops which were um, cultivators were forced to grow, things like indigo and um, later on opium for the China trade. Okay. And things like sugarcane as well as jute, which is also used like for making um, ropes and things. So you can't eat this kind of thing, of course. So if you're a farmer and you're growing a commodity crop, you're crucially dependent on commodity prices. Um, and these are crops also which are widely traded on a, uh, not only a regional, but even really a global market. So that slumps in the prices of these commodities could, leave, could really significantly reduce the income of farming families. Okay. So part of the British colonial project was to rationalize and regularize um, the mapping, documentation, and revenue collection of uh, agricultural land, um, and to make lists of owners to make legible who owned what and who was responsible for what kind of payment and taxes. That all sounds fine, except when you think about that kind of a, a situation in which the landscape itself is moving and shifting and changing, and the locations of fields and villages are also moving and shifting and changing. So to try and fix that to a particular location, as we'll see, created certain kinds of problems, okay, in this kind of ambiguous mix of land and water. The, um, under what was called the permanent settlement, that is a kind of a tax, a tax plan, the British set up something known as the zamindari system. Here you can see a very um, portly zamindar um, from Dhaka, which is now the capital of Bangladesh. Here in the right, the zamindars were a kind of intermediary level of rural landlords. Um, some of whom were, whose positions were in a sense invented by the British. So there was a kind of idea that the zamindars would be something like the rural gentry of England, that they would be out there in the countryside, improving agriculture, providing kind of civilizing influence and facilitating um, colonial rule. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't always work out this way. And when we get to South India, we'll see that the British tried there an entirely different system of tax, um, tax organization in which individual agriculturalists owed taxes directly to the government. So under the Zamindari system, the Zamindar collected taxes from all of the villages under his um, purview. And if he wanted a little extra, hey, you know, that's fine. And a lot of Zamindars grew very, very rich. Okay. So. In this kind of system of permanence and rationalization of cash taxes and changes in the way titles of land were assigned and the changing com um, reliance on commercial agriculture as opposed to subsistence agriculture, we can see that this combined with the kind of physical transformations of the landscape, the landscape that was controlled and tamed and, and diked up and, uh, and banked, um, changed uh, a situation in which floods were welcome, annual, normal kinds of events to w in which floods were problematic, damaging, and uh, difficult. Okay. So it's the w not only did the landscape itself change, but also the way in which people related to the landscape change. So we built, we had a world which was built on a model where land and water uh, were, were distinct. That is, in England, the idea that uh, a field would just suddenly disappear one year and a new, a new plot of land would appear in another location seemed very strange. So we have a kind of whole system of governance, taxation, and expectation on the part of the colonial government that's not really applicable to the physical environment in which they found themselves uh, in the Bengal Delta. So under the British, uh, in British India, Bengal was a very, very large province, um, including today's West Bengal in India, and also uh, the entire today's country of Bangladesh, and parts of what are now the states of Orissa and Bihar in India. And there was a very controversial colonial proposal to break Bengal uh, in two, to partition it, um, as a bid really to control the area politically. This was um, wildly unpopular uh, and was eventually rescinded. But if we think that breaking a single region, the Bengal Delta, into administratively within the same country was a problem, 
we can see that there's a much bigger problem was created in 1947 with Indian independence. So the region of Bengal is an area that's culturally and linguistically uh, relatively uh, united. The same language is spoken in West Bengal and in Bangladesh. And of course you already know, I think, what happened in 1947 with the establishment of um, independence of India, which was done very, very hastily, actually. The British withdrawal was done um, unexpectedly quickly, and lines were carefully calculated, I mean, casually calculated, to separate um, Muslim dominant from Hindu dominant uh, provinces and to create uh, two new countries. The two new countries that were created were India and Pakistan. Pakistan is the green bit here on the map, and there are two parts of Pakistan, West Pakistan and East Pakistan. Not connected to one another, entirely separated by the vast expanse of India, in totally different kinds of environments, different cultural traditions, different languages, the only real connection in many ways is uh, Islam. All right, so there was um, horrific uh, inter interreligious, intercommunity violence at the time of partition, especially in West Pakistan, less so in East Pakistan. Um, but um, the newly created peace of East Pakistan was separated from its heart in a kind of very important way. So the largest city was Calcutta, still is. But the agricultural hinterland of Calcutta um, was really cut away and put into East Pakistan. So for example, the jute production, um, all of the mills for making jute were in Calcutta, which was now in India, and all the jute growing areas were in Bangladesh, which was now, or now Bangladesh, in, in East Pakistan, now a totally different and antagonistic country. India and Pakistan, as you may know, have fought several wars, so they're not exactly friends. All right, so this seemed destined uh, to fail, and fail it did. Um, and in 1971, uh, a relatively brief war was fought between India and pa uh, Pakistan over the fate of uh, East Pakistan. And uh, with the help of India, East Pakistan became the independent country of Bangladesh uh, in 1971. OK. So what we have then is a kind of sad history, really, of some of the world's uh, richest farmland in the world, which has really been sliced, diced, and dammed, um, and is now one of the most disaster-prone countries uh, in the world. I, I gave you a couple of examples. I don't know if you can read those, um, of um, cyclones, uh, floods, tornadoes, uh, and so on, that have had um, some really significant impact. Flooding continues to be a problem um, in Bangladesh, and it's exacerbated by erosion and deforestation in the Himalaya. So you can see a little kind of diagram here. You can see the Ganges on the bottom, Bamraputra on the right. Um, and you can see the effect that er erosion and deforestation will have on the downstream areas. And also a problem is that a lot of Ganges River water is taken off for irrigation in India on the upstream side, which has reduced the amount of silt coming down uh, into uh, Bangladesh. So here we have a landscape which was already modified by levees and embankments starting in the 18th and 19th century, further affected by changes far upstream and actually outside the country. And it just so happens that some of the most vulnerable people in the country live in the highest risk areas, the areas that are very low lying and prone to flooding. And if you want to just add to that another fun fact, uh, we have the problem of rising sea levels, right? So um, Bangladesh, which is the sort of red and yellow piece right there in the middle, is a very high uh, risk for impacts of global warming. So how is Bangladesh itself then, which is maybe not fair to Bangladesh, which is a marvelous place, an engineered disaster, right? So changes in the landscape itself, the construction of levees and embankments, the deforestation and erosion uh, in the Himalaya, the diversion of Ganges water and its silt upstream have certainly all played a factor. So human transformations of the environment. But what's also been important, as important really, is how people relate to the landscape itself. So that now there's an insistence on permanence on building solid structures and then getting upset when they wash away. 
um, mobility options for people are much reduced because of things like poverty, because of structures of land tenure and opportunity, and of course, perhaps the most obvious thing, the fact that there are new international boundaries now that make the migration, for example, of a Bengali or a Bengali language speaker from one part, one region to another into an international refugee. So there was always a lot of mobility back and forth around Bengal because of the nature of the landscape, but now there's a giant international barrier in the middle. And now, of course, with global climate change and rising sea levels, uh, we see in a country which has, you might say, extremely low levels of per capita consumption, so there are many Bangladeshis, but they have very small carbon footprint, each one of them, but they have a kind of high, high vulnerability and a long history of inequality at multiple levels uh, from the individual to the nation. Okay, let's go south now uh, to an entirely different environment, to the peninsular uh, part of India, where if, Bangla if the Bengal Delta was a very high rainfall area, you can see in the blue there, we're going to go down now in the area from Bilari south, a very low rainfall area. So we're going to go from too much water to too little, but in both cases what we'll see is it's not just the quantity, either water or food that's at issue, but it's really more about the distribution and about the structures of power um, and inequality. So in this part of peninsular India, the area of the Deccan Plateau in the south, um, we see an environment that is very much um, affected by the massive rain shadow created by mountain range along, along the southwest coast of India. So there's a little wet spot, wet sort of uh, patch on the lo lower left, um, but you have very dry and very erratic rainfall uh, in the rest of the area. So in this region, we have a sharp differentiation in agricultural production. You have the production of crops like rice, which are very limited in extent because they can only be grown with irrigation. Um, in some areas, we have pre-colonial canals and reservoirs, which are very extensive, and it's possible to grow these very highly productive kinds of crops like rice. So some farmers in this area then, notwithstanding the fact that rainfall is very low, are in an excellent situation. They have access to irrigation, they have fairly minimal dependence on rainfall, they're able to grow very um, valuable and favored crops like rice. Most farmers, however, are not in this kind of situation. They um, grow hardy millets and sorghum, and they tend to be almost totally dependent on rainfall. So millets and sorghum here are the food of the poor, whereas rice is really the food of the rich. Okay, so cotton then too is another rainfall dependent crop uh, in this region. Okay, so South Asia has been a very highly stratified society for a long time, and there were certainly disasters prior to colonization and prior to the 19th century. Um, but it's clear that what we see pre-colonially, and the evidence is not as good as we would like, I'd be the first to admit, is that the scale of past disasters, famines in particular, tends to be more small and localized than the kinds of large-scale um, uh, famines that we see in the colonial period. And some of the kinds of strategies, I don't want to go into this in too much detail, but it's worth thinking about how do people manage these kinds of shortfalls. So if there is a failure of rain and a problem of crop failure, then what do people do? They do various kinds of things. On the one hand, the most important thing people do is just move, right? Um, they also uh, very often paid their land revenues in kind, that is as a share of the crop. And if you pay a share of the crop and you don't have a crop, there's not much, not much problem, right? But if you owe cash, um, and then you're, you're out of luck, right? There's a tradition of forgiveness of land revenue on the part of rulers and a kind of tradition of public charity also to feeding people uh, who are hungry. So what we see is even where there are areas that are highly marketized with um, sort of market-based economies prior to colonization is that grain markets tended to be high, very highly localized. So if there's a crop failure, yes, the price of food goes up, no question about it. But it goes up only in the area where there's crop failure, not across the entire subcontinent or the entire peninsula as happened in the 19th century. And then finally, there's also the possibility people had of collecting famine foods, collecting wild foods and various kinds of other um, resources in forests and so on that became less, less available to them later on, particularly with the establishment of colonial forest laws that kept people out of um, the massive numbers of reserved forests. Something like over 10% of the Indian land mass is now under um, federally reserved forests. Okay, so for all farmers everywhere then, we have these kind of recurrent themes. They need access to land, they need access to water, 
and in this, under this kind of regime, they also need access to um, traction and manure. So traction and manure in this case means livestock. All right. So what we see when we see the ex extension of urbanization and commercialization, because the story we just saw again, we just saw it on the Bengal Delta, right, where people are growing jute, indigo, sugarcane, opium, and so on, um, is uh, that non-farmers who will always have to purchase food, right, so that the food security of non-farmers tends to be relatively um, reliant on purchasing power, and they tend to be usually at high risk. Farmers themselves historically tend to be more food secure because even if the price of your crops has fallen, you can at least eat it, right? But if you're growing something that's a commodity, that's, that's not a possibility, okay? So cities, markets, cash economies, said they're not a colonial invention, but there's a problem that really exacerbated under colonial um, rule. And this, this brings up the problem, which I know some of the other speakers have uh, mentioned, of what the um, uh, eco Indian economist Amar Chasen referred to as exchange entitlements. All right? That is a sort of purchasing power plus. So the, the argument that he made, as we'll see based on the 1943 Bengal famine, was it was not that famines are created by an overall shortage of food. And this is true with all the famines we look at in South Asia. It's not that there's not enough food. There is enough food. It's that food, people are not able to get access to food because they don't have the purchasing power to get it. And that's purchasing power includes things like networks of entitlement to food, family members who have to help you, um, various kinds of traditional service arrangements like the village barber would always get a share of the crop, um, patronage arrangements like the landlord felt obligated to feed you um, because you're his, he's your patron, um, or even of course things like money and other assets, jewelry and cash. So exchange entitlements really determine who eats and who doesn't, right? So sheer productivity is hardly ever the most important factor. Okay, so southern India was brought under colonial rule in stages, a little bit after um, the Bengal Delta, and um, the area we're talking about here formed what was called the, the uh, Madras Presidency under British colonial rule. Um, it, it established, uh, most of this area was taken in around 1799. Okay, so the like in Bengal, we see that the colonial enterprise in South Asia was very much um, about turning a profit, right? So all of the expenses, for example, in running India, um, including the salaries of all the British colonial officers and so on, uh, were charged directly to India. These were known as the home charges. Uh, uh, this, this on top of the regular tax revenues uh, extracted by the government that went to England, and of course, in addition to policies that tended to favor British entry and British industries uh, over those in the colonies. So when it comes to famine and famine relief, we can see that cost calculations were paramount. And if you read the British colonial documents, it's actually really chilling to look at how um, various kinds of junior officers are bragging to the senior officers about how cheaply they're managing the famine. Um, so here, just as in Bengal, we can see the kind of rationalization of land tenure, involved mapping, permanent revenue settlements, and the expansion of a cash, uh, a cash economy. And one of the elements of that cash economy um, in the Deccan Plateau uh, region in particular what, of the dry fields, the rainfall-fed fields, was the expansion of commercial cotton production. And there was, here's my favorite graph of the whole thing. I'll explain it in a minute. There was a big impact in the Deccan of the cotton boom, which was a product really of the US Civil War. So this is um, a US cotton price data. If you look at the graph on the lower right, you can see that that's the price of cotton. It starts to peak in about 1860. Keep these dates in mind, because we're going to get to this. And it crashes in 1865, the end of the American Civil War. And by 1880, cotton prices are back to pre-peak pre levels. The scale of this boom, though, is so well illustrated by this ridiculous graph in which the peak price goes up there and just bangs right into Chicago. Seems so perfect for us somehow. Okay, So what we had then is um, at the moment, we're going to get there in a minute, in 1876, I know Dane Borges already talked about 1877, 
um, was that the, these farmers and these very vulnerable farmers, this very dry region, who were very reliant on cotton production and really expanded cotton production with those very high prices, were already in very bad shape. And there was a process of transition going on from India being a textile producing powerhouse prior to colonization to being a net exporter of raw cotton for British uh, production of textiles in the new, the new industrialized mills of northern England. So the Great South Indian Famine of 1876-1878 was certainly uh, initiated by a monsoon failure, right? This was a, a global, a worldwide phenomenon. I know that you were recommended some piece of the Mike Davis book. Um, Late Victorian Holocaust also talks about this, so it's an, uh, an El Nino Inso event, um, and there was a monsoon a a failure. It was, the number of deaths is very difficult to work out. Um, the low sort of official figures around five and a half million. Some recent scholarly estimates suggest something more like 29 million people died in this family. These are just unbelievable numbers. It's very hard to get your head around. But what we can see then is that the relationship between rainfall productivity and famine though was actually surprisingly weak. So I've done some analysis on this particular famine and there were actually years with lower rainfall that didn't have the same kind of um, serious famine effect. So it's not only a rainfall failure, which definitely did happen, but it's a conjunction of other kinds of events um, that we've already started to talk about. Okay. So famine years were not always the worst rainfall wise. The second factor of course was this radically unequal purchasing power. Um, in 1876 and in some other famines, um, what we see, there was a pretty much no remission of land revenue on the part of the colonial government. They wanted to collect their taxes regardless. And they were in some cases convinced to um, forgive people a sort of a, an extension of paying taxes. So. If you've been weakened by uh, famine and you've lost perhaps your land, your bullocks, your seed, all of your gold ornaments, everything you had, it's going to be difficult to pay your taxes next year too, right? So that certainly made it more difficult to recover from famine, right? Um, there was also a movement um, of crops to higher profit markets. So we'll talk about this in a minute, but it was similar to the famine uh, in um, Ireland, a time when large amounts of food products were being exported from starving South, South India to other areas uh, where people were able to afford them. So we see that we have a kind of um, commitment on the part of British colonial officials specifically to a free market ideology. And they wanted to um, make sure that as they saw it, the natural operation of the grain markets was unimpeded. So never mind that political power itself creates grain markets, um, nevertheless. So what we see are three kinds of factors that are uh, in the British colonial imagination seen as natural, completely entirely natural. On the one hand, rainfall. On the second, poverty. And on the third, the operation of markets. So this is a natural disaster in the sense that these all come together. And where these factors are seen as natural, of course, it's easier for the government to seed any uh, obligation to act. So I mentioned that there was a major export of food throughout the famine. This is a very famous drawing of bags of grain um, on the beach in Madras uh, awaiting export. Of course they had to be protected by um, government troops. Um, 64 million hundred weight of wheat were exported to England uh, in one year alone in 1877. Um, and I don't have the figures for rice and other crops which would be much more significant because not really wheat growing area. So then we had a situation with very, very high cost of food um, and rural artisans and uh, commercial farmers were basically um, out of luck. There is some evidence that the newly constructed railroads were helpful uh, when the government finally did start some famine relief uh, in moving grain in, but just as much or probably more grain moved out on the new railroads um, to help speculators move food away from poor people with minimal purchasing power, power, purchasing power to areas like cities or even um, England where people had more money to spend. Okay. So the government um, was really criminally slow to respond 
Um, the regional government in Madras, the head of the uh, Madras presidency, actually waited after the southwest monsoon rains of the summer failed entirely. They thought maybe they'd wait and see if the winter or northeast monsoon would arrive. Um, not perhaps considering that some of the inland interior districts of the uh, Madras presidency never get any northeast monsoon rains in the best of years and are entirely dependent on the southwest monsoon. They were pretty slow to set up relief, but they finally did, and they insisted on um, uh, a primacy of relief projects that were work, work for food, hard labor, um, often uh, even from the very weak and the very ill. There was an official restriction on private charity because they thought it would make the government look bad, and that also it promoted dependence and slacking. There was a great concern on the part uh, of the British government about the laziness and undependability of Indian people. Okay. So the relief projects were often very some far distance from people's homes, and people were required to stay out of the relief works to prove that they really needed it. Um, and um, there were very strict sets of qualifications about who could and could not qualify for work on the relief projects. If you had any money at all, or even a nice looking loincloth, you could be stricken from the rolls. Um, they were paid in grain, a very, very small ration, which was um, set up by uh, a British colonial officer, Temple, and is even now so very famous as the Temple Wage. Less than one grain of one pound of grain um, for an adult male worker, for example. Um, Davis, in late Victorian holocausts, um, draws comparisons between what people were being fed in prison at the same time, which was more, and also the um, number of calories given to um, concentration camp inmates at Birkenau, which was significantly more than the temple ration. And these were people doing very hard physical labor, building dams, uh, roads, railroads, etc. Okay, so we have to understand the British government doctrine, I think, in terms of the two twin doctrines. On the one hand, the idea of a kind of adherence to a Malthusian population model, right? They felt that Indians were poor because there are so many Indians. And in a kind of really Scrooge-like sense, I can only say that excess mortality, even from famines, was in some sense almost natural and even desirable because it would decrease the surplus population. Not all British officers thought that, obviously, but some did. And this is clear, this is in spite of clear evidence that there was, in fact, no overall food shortage on a peninsular scale. Okay. But even more important, uh, yeah, was the free trade ideology. So here you see a picture of starving people in front of the uh, moneylender merchant's uh, shop. And there's a kind of almost sacred belief in the efficiency of markets. And it made the government very reluctant to purchase grain. And this was kind of convenient since they didn't want to spend money anyway. And when the Madras government, the regional government, actually did purchase some grain in secret, they were very severely reprimanded by the central government in Calcutta. So we, there were no restrictions on exporting food. It was, it was done in some earlier famines. There were no price controls. There were a very minimal government grain purchases, all in the fear of artificially distorting the grain markets. Um, there was even pressure in some uh, cases to pay relief workers on projects in cash um, so that the government would not have to make any grain purchase. Okay. So they saw the market then as being just as natural, really, as rainfall. So we have a situation in which we have fat, well-fed merchants. You can see side by side with the starving. And I think it hardly bears mentioning that no British uh, officials starved to death. So the famine mortality, like all famine mortality, is very closely linked to the, expand the spread of disease. Um, something, as I said, between 5 and 29 million people are estimated to have died, and something like 58 million to have been, in this great colonial expression, distressed. Distressed and severely distressed are the way in which people talked about poverty, hunger, disease, basically everything up to actually being dead. Okay, so who was most affected? Most affected were rural agricultural laborers and artisans, mostly poorer people without land or with small fields, especially dry farmers, people without irrigated fields. One of the other um, effects, of course, of this was um, to expand the South Asian diaspora and hundreds of thousands of Indian workers left to be uh, plantation workers or coolies on colonial plantations around the Old World and New World too. 
And the same year, the next year, 1877, um, there was a huge imperial durbar, a very fancy celebration um, in Calcutta celebrating the coronation of Queen Victoria and declaring Queen Victoria the Empress of India. It was very expensive and lavish at the height of the Great South Indian Famine. So here's the Viceroy of India, Edward Lytton, who de decided he was not going to tour the famine districts. Um, and this uh, overall situation, I'm no about it out of time, really sparked outrage. Right? So um, there was uh, a study and the 1883 Famine Code was established to prevent the worst kind of abuses that emerged in this famine. And there, there were some improvements suggested, I'll just to cut it short, but the major impulse to support free trade uh, was, was um, approved. So we'll skip that free crane storm. You can ask me about it. It's a cool story. So was this a natural disaster, the Great South Indian Famine of 1876-78, or was it engineered? There was certainly a decline in rainfall, no question, linked to this INSO event. But that was not actually the worst one in this century, um, and it was certainly a combination of factors that led to disasters here. First, we had a situation in dry, which dry farmers were already very highly vulnerable. While a lucky few farmers had access to canal water and they could produce reliable, productive crops like rice, these were the farmers who had the most political clout and are the most resources. Dry farming was risky and it was practiced by those with the least political influence. The story we just hear over and over, right? And there was of course a whole underclass who worked on these fields without actually owning them or having any um, title to them. We also see other kinds of factors like um, land revenues um, and lack of tax reductions, more commercial production, um, grain markets, and lack of access to forest lands. So if we agree, or if you want to think that nature includes the operation of grain markets and that it's natural for some people to have access to resources and power and other people not to, then maybe, sure, it was a natural disaster. But if not, I think we have to see these events as being socio-natural, as joint outcomes of human and non-human action. So just as a quick postscript then, the Bengal famine of 1943, uh, much like the previous one, in all of its kinds of factors and horrific suffering, um, but with the added dimension of war. 1943, I think you know where we are. Um, and here we have a situation in which um, the Burma Delta had been transformed into a kind of rice bowl, um, which was very important uh, for the production of rice to the Bengal Delta. We're back to the Bengal Delta here. But when the Japanese took Burma, that source of rice was cut off and Bengal was in trouble. But the British colonial government was much more concerned, one might, uh, it's quite clear, with the war effort really than with the problem of um, provision of food. So like other sets of famines, we see a kind of complex set of causes, both natural and cultural, um, which power relations played an important part. This is a very important famine in British, in Indian history too, because first of all, it was the one studied by a Marcia Sen, uh, the Nobel Prize winning economist who came up with the idea of exchange entitlements. Um, but also it was very uh, much a rallying point in the Indian independence movement. And in fact, um, when the government sent a telegram back to England explaining how bad things were in Bengal, Churchill famously replied, well, if it's that bad, why hasn't Gandhi died? Okay, now we're just going to end um, my very last, shortest um, thing with uh, independent India, post-1947. Here we have a memory of famines, including the famine of 1943, still very fresh in the minds of the um, newly independent um, government. And there were major efforts on the part of the Indian government to end famine, and in fact, they did. Right? There's been no change really to the monsoons since the 19th century. The change was in the government. Um, and we see an Indian government which has significant willingness to intervene in grain markets, to provide subsidized grains and other food, to import food. And although there's certainly a very checkered history of success and failure and corruption here, to support the production of more food as well. So this is a whole other talk, really. Um, but I want to just say that the possibilities for disaster are not limited to colonial governments but can operate anywhere, right, where 
vulnerabilities, inequalities, and power relations um, hold sway. So we have a whole country of Bangladesh, which is in some sense held down by its history, right? And the flexibility of Bangladeshis about what to do, for example, in the face of rising sea levels is quite limited because of the political history that created that country and the environmental history that changed uh, hydrological regimes. Similarly, within India, what we see, and again, this is a second talk, which I'm not really going to give you, is that some of the sort of fixes that were created or imagined on the part of the government of independent India to, to stop famine, the ways in which people tried to prevent famine, have actually created new kinds of disasters uh, for millions of landless, poor, and politically non-influential groups. And one of these has to do with the contemporary mania in India for dam construction. China and India are the two most active dam building countries in the world. In the US, we're taking down more dams than we're putting up, but India is actively building them uh, with the idea of the extension of uh, both hydroelectric power and also irrigation. But what we see is just like in 1876 in the Deccan that a very few people get irrigation, where many, many more in this case get really less than nothing, uh, since their homes, uh, temples, and uh, lands are being inundated underwater. And the, most, the largest and most controversial of these projects is the Narmada project on the Narmada River in western India. It's a project that's um, ongoing. Um, hundreds of dams uh, are planned, ha planned to be built uh, on the Narmada River. Something like 1.5 million people are estimated to be displaced. These are huge numbers and it's kind of hard to get your mind around millions, I think. There's uh, over 200,000 people officially uh, uh, registered as oustees that has been pushed off their lands who have not been resettled. Other people have been given relatively sort of poor or subpar land. And of course, only those people who were landowners in the first place or had title to land, clear title to land, which is not that many people in a country like India, um, were given compensation. So landless laborers basically got nothing. Okay. So overall, um, in the Narmada project and in many, many other large dam projects in India, we can see millions of oustees um, from dam construction uh, in order to provide um, some power and irrigation for other people. And in the case of the Narmada project, almost all of the benefit is going um, to the western state of Gujarat, which is relatively affluent, urbanized state, and most of the people affected, whose houses, homes will be inundated and so on, are in the slightly further east um, state of Madhya Pradesh, uh, and they're poor people, low caste, landless, and especially tribal peoples. All right, so this last slide. So we have too much water, too little water, rain that falls at the wrong time, new crop disease, uh, sea level rise. All of these are deeply influenced, of course, by factors which are beyond human control. But just as the rising uh, contemporary rise in sea levels is in part, as we know, an outcome of human action, so too are some of the kinds of conditions that lead to floods, for example, across the Bengal, Bengal countryside. The construction of levees and embankments, including just roads and railroads, the upstream deforestation, um, and um, erosion in the Himalaya. So these are things that are physical transformations of the environment made by humans over thousands of years. In the Deccan too, in the area which sometimes called the scarcity track for agricultural production, um, our own research of my team has showed that the landscapes, the soils, the hydrologies of this region has actually a product of thousands of years of human history and human occupation. So really even the natural environment itself should be thought of as an artifact. But equally important to that is the way that people relate to the landscape, right? So in Bengal, we see a shift from being a flood adapted to being flood prone. In the Deccan, we can see that the differentiation between irrigated and dry land and the kind of modalities of different kinds of irrigation works fundamentally restructured people's relationship with rainfall. So if you have access to a river-fed canal, your relationship to the monsoon rain is totally different than if you have a dry farm millet field or something like that. In India today, we can see that the Narmada project is primarily benefiting a relatively few people. And probably people are wealthier and more politically connected, wealthy farmers and urbanites in Gujarat, and displacing poor tribal uh, and landless people in Madhya Pradesh. So as ever, we say really one's place in the world, socially and politically, makes a great deal of difference in whether we can think of, say, a dam as a blessing or as itself a disaster. 
So I guess, uh, I don't have a great conclusion, I guess. So that's really my conclusion, that we need to recognize the composite construction of disasters. So they're these kind of complex beasts. They're natural, they're social, and also I think it's important to remember they're historical, right? They're messy, they're upsetting, and they illustrate our complex interdependence both with one another and with the natural world. Um, you said a, a lot of good things, actually. Um, but the one main question that I guess I have is um, pre-colonialism. I mean, because you started off saying that people live there because of the irrigation or the agriculture. Um, pre-colonialism, how many people lived there? Because the first question I asked myself was, who would live there if, you know, the water's rising like yeah. this? So, right. I'm, what was the population yeah, so talking like? About, uh, talking about Bengal, the Bengal Delta, it's, well, I mean, you have to realize, of course, that the size of the Delta has been getting bigger. So, over the last couple of hundred years, there's more Bengal Delta than ever before, right? But people have been living there so I'm an archaeologist, so I always like to start at the very beginning, right? But people have been living um, in the Bengal Delta pretty much, you know, for like eight or 9,000 years, right? But especially once people started doing agriculture, and um, it's an area that produces rice, very abundant and very delicious, marvelous rice. Um, and uh, so it's always been a very popular place to live because the, the soil is so fertile, right? But there's always, when you're growing rice, um, you know, I showed you some pictures of rice paddies where you have submergence for a good part of the year. So you need a lot of water. Um, but the mo rice paddies actually get most of their nutrients from the, not from the soil, the underlying soil, but from the water. So it's all this water flowing through this silt rich water and that's full of nutrients and incredibly beneficial to crop growth. So um, Bengal in India now and Bangladesh are areas that are actually very, very fantastic places for growing rice. And so as long as you're willing to sort of set up a, a way of life that adjusts to the fact that it's an active floodplain, that rivers shift around and move and they, you know, suddenly there's a little island that wasn't there yesterday. I mean, it's fairly dramatic, right? So what that means is you have to have the you know, kind of lifestyle that's gonna make that possible. And people did do that for thousands of years, right? So, I mean, I know it seems like a, like, I, I thought that too, growing up, like, why would anyone live in Bangladesh? It sounds awful. But it's marvelous, actually. Okay. Yeah. First. That's always been a very densely populated area. So, um, the, yeah, so, it's mostly post-independence, I would say, and there's a huge increase, right? So things like the, all of these famines actually had quite significant impacts on demographic levels. So like 1876, 77, 1943, all of those actually depressed regional population for um, you know, several generations. So with the suppression of famine, um, there, was, there has actually been, yeah, population growth. First, I thought there was a nice tie-in between uh, the last talk, talking about discrimination and national, natural disasters and this one. Um, what would it take to make Bangladesh, bring it back to its floodplain status and make it uh, viable again as an agricultural area without the, the human loss? Yeah, and I'm, luckily I'm not a policy person, <laughs> but more of an historian. But, I think that, you know, it always makes me, it always makes me think of our own attempt to control rivers in this country, right? And I don't know if anybody was thinking about New Orleans and Katrina when I was talking about levees and trying to manage a giant mobile river system, right? But the Mississippi is, you know, small potatoes compared to the Ganges Brahmaputra system. Um, so it's, to the extent that there are big cities, uh, Dhaka is not, Dhaka is up on slightly to the northeast and on a less active part of the floodplain, actually. But to the extent that there are cities, I mean, I suppose, you know, there's maybe some imperative to protect them. But, and, and, and I'm, not, I'm not an engineer or, you know, 
But I would say, maybe let the, let the rivers flow, right? Let the rivers flow through. But what that means is that we also, you have to really rethink things like land tenure systems then. Because if you own, if I own this piece of land right here in Swift Hall, and not here tomorrow, I have to have some other way of getting access to land, right? So where there are sort of community land tenure systems, which we know we have in some places um, prior to colonization, where people have rights to use certain lands, usufruct rights, but they're reallocated periodically, say within the village or something like that, um, over time. So if you have a bigger family, you have more land, you have a smaller family, less land, and so on. Not to say that it was a, um, an egalitarian paradise in the past. That's not at all the case, right? So, I mean, it would take a lot of changing, right? It would take a lot of changing. And then the other problem really are international borders, right? So mobility has always been a great response to problem. So people move, they, they leave a place where the crops failed or there's a flood and they go somewhere else. But there have to be options in those other places, ways for them to become part of the society and make a living. And things like international borders make that kind of much more difficult. Uh, let us thank Professor Morrison. Okay.